Welcome to Chapter 30, Assessment of the Cardiovascular System. We will start on page 611 in your Iggy book. Concepts for this chapter include perfusion as our priority concept, and then fluid and electrolyte balance as the interrelated concept. The surface anatomy of the heart, this is a review from anatomy and physiology and also from fundamentals. You should know that your circulation system is a continuous loop. The blood is kept moving constantly due to shifting pressure gradients. There are valves in your heart that control this, and there are also valves in other vessels in your body. Um, but the pressure is always going to shift from areas of higher pressure to lower pressure. So the blood will move in the correct direction depending on what the pressure, where the pressure takes it. Now you know the left side of the heart receives blood from the lungs and pumps it into the circulation throughout the body. And the right side of the heart receives blood from the body and pumps it into the lungs to be oxygenated. This is on page 614 in your Iggy book. This shows figure 30.2 in your text on page 614. This is the blood flow through the heart and you have the dark arrows showing the unoxygenated blood and the white arrows showing the oxygenated blood. So you can see how the blood flows and when it's going out to the body and so forth. The cardiac valves, as I mentioned before, the four cardiac valves keep the blood flowing in a forward motion. Pressure changes cause the valves to open and close. The AV valves separate atria from ventricles. So you have the mitral valve, which separates the left atria from the left ventricle, and the tricuspid valve, which separates the right atria from the right ventricle. These are known as the atrioventricular or AV valves. The semilunar valves are the pulmonic valve that separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary artery, and the aortic valve that separates the left ventricle from the aorta. They are called semilunar because they're shaped kind of like a half moon. They keep blood from flowing back into the ventricle when it is at, is at rest, um, which is a very minute period of time. However, there is, is a period where um, the ventricles are refilling. Um, this is called diastole. Systole is when the pump happens and the ventricle squeeze. Then after that is diastole so they would be relaxed during that time. And you wouldn't want blood flowing back into the ventricle that it had already pushed out. So that's what the semilunar valves are for. The mean arterial pressure needed to maintain adequate perfusion is between 60 and 70 millimeters of mercury. And the equation that they use to find the mean arterial pressure is two times the diastolic like when you take a blood pressure um, measurement, you talk about systolic blood pressure and diastolic, right? Upper and lower numbers. So two times your diastolic plus the systolic over or divided by three. On page 615 in your text, you will see figure 30.4. This shows you the sequence of events during the cardiac cycle. The S1, S2, S3, S4, those are the sounds that are being made, okay? So S1, S2 is the lub-dub, the normal or usual sound of, that the heart makes when you auscultate. So S1 occurs with the closure of the AV valves and signals the beginning of systole. The mitral component slightly precedes the tricuspid component. So your, when your mitral valve opens, it will, it will be heard loudest at the apex of the heart. So you have to figure out where the apex is, don't you? Okay, S2 occurs with the closure of the semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonic valves. This signals the end of systole. Your S2 sound, the dub, because you know it's love dub, okay, the dub sound is loudest at the base. Um, at the base of the heart, even though it is heard over the precordium. So, in other words, you'll be able to hear, you'll be able to hear both these sounds all over 
the chest, usually the precordium, um, but we're just telling you where it's heard the loudest, okay? S3 normally is silent, so this is an extra heart sound that you don't normally hear. Um, but the S, S3, sometimes conditions happen where there's ventricular filling that creates vibrations that can be heard. The S3 will happen when the ventricles resist filling during early rapid um, refilling phase. Usually the S3 will occur immediately after the S2 when the AV valves open and atrial pressure pours into the ventricles. S4 is another sound that you don't normally hear, um, but it is it will occur just before S1. And the S4 can be heard a lot of times in children um, and also in athletes. So we're going to talk about cardiac output, heart rate, stroke volume, preload, and afterload. Your cardiac output is determined by multiplying the heart rate times the stroke volume it is the amount of blood that is pumped out of the left ventricle every minute. So in a normal adult, the range is between four to seven liters per minute. It's a lot of blood if you think about how much that is. And of course, different people with different body sizes um, have a different cardiac output need. So we use what's called the cardiac index to calculate, um, to adjust for the differences in body size. The cardiac index is determined by dividing the cardiac output by the person's body surface area. Normally, um, the heart rate will be between 60 and 100. There's going to be an increase in rate if there is an increase in myocardial oxygen demand. The autonomic nervous system is responsible for extrinsically controlling the heart rate. It adjusts rapidly when necessary to regulate the cardiac output. The parasympathetic system slows the heart rate, whereas the sympathetic system increases the heart rate. So if you think about it, we talk about people doing a vagal maneuver, um, meaning they cough or they bear down like they're having a bowel movement. Um, this stimulates the vagus nerve, which stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system to slow down the heart rate. So that's how that works. Maybe that'll help you remember it. An increase in circulating catecholamines, such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, will cause the heart rate to increase, also causes contractility to increase. A lot of cardiovascular drugs, especially beta blockers, block this sympathetic fight or flight pattern by decreasing the heart rate, okay? Now, what is stroke volume? This is the amount of blood ejected by the left ventricle during each contraction. Several variables influence stroke volume and ultimately cardiac output. The variables, variables excuse me, include heart rate, preload, afterload, and contractility. So when we're discussing preload, this refers to the degree of myocardial fiber stretch at the end of diastole and just before contraction. So the end of diastole just before systole, which is the pump, okay? So the stretch imposed on the muscle fibers results from the volume contained within the ventricle at the end of diastole. So diastole, remember, is the filling of the ventricle. So now how much is that ventricle stretched? How much are those myocardial fibers stretched just before the ventricle pumps? This is your preload. <clears throat> now your vascular system is simply what carries your blood around, the vessels in your body. The blood has to have a route to travel. It goes from the heart to nourish the rest of the body. It carries cellular waste to the excretory organs. It allows lymphatic flow to drain tissue fluid back and put it back into circulation and also returns blood to the heart for recirculation. You have an arterial 
system which delivers the oxygen and nutrients to various body organs and tissues. And what regulates our blood flow is the blood pressure. So how is blood pressure regulated? We have three ways that it is regulated. The autonomic nervous system excites or inhibits the sympathetic nervous system activity in response to impulses from various areas in the body, like the baroreceptors, remember those are in the aortic arch and also in the carotid arteries. These respond to stretching of the arterial walls by inhibiting the vasomotor center located in the medulla and pons or chemoreceptors also found in the aortic arch and carotids and in the respiratory center of the brain are responsive to hypoxia and hypercapnia, which respond by stimulating the vagus nerves and raising the blood pressure. Central chemoreceptors elicit a central nervous system response 10 times stronger than the peripheral chemoreceptors. So the baroreceptors are the, um, are the central chemoreceptors, okay? Kidneys also help regulate blood pressure. You know about the renin-angiotensin system. Um, kidneys retain water and sodium when there is a decrease in perfusion or blood flow that in turn increases blood pressure. Fluid retention and activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism causes blood pressure to rise. Also, ADH from the posterior pituitary gland regulates vascular volume. So we have to have plenty of volume in order to keep our blood pressure up, okay? Other factors include emotional behaviors, if you're excited or angry or in a lot of pain, your blood pressure will be higher. If you, of course, have increased physical activities and also alterations in body temperature cause fluctuations in blood pressure. The venous system is made up of veins that sit right next to the arteries. Of course, this is another part of the blood circulation. Um, Veins, the great thing about them is they have an ability to accommodate a lot of fluid or a lot of volume of fluid and also changes, shifts in volume of fluid. Um, this doesn't change the pressure in the venous system when there are large volumes or small volumes going through. So this is why we use the vein system for doing IVs, for giving IV fluids and blood and things to the IVs. Okay, now how does the system work? Well, again, there are little valves in these veins and the valves keep the blood flowing in the correct direction. Another interesting thing is you actually have a force provided by your skeletal muscles that assists blood in going in the correct direction. I bet you did not know that. <laughs> so one day when you're on Jeopardy, you can answer that question. Um, and there is a hydrostatic pressure that um, when you're standing upright, there is a, a delay in venous return because of that pressure. So when people are lying down, they will have better venous return from their lower extremities. Cardiovascular changes associated with aging we're going to look at page 618. There's a large chart there that goes over the valves, the conduction system, the left ventricle, the aorta and other large arteries, as well as the baroreceptors. When you're taking a history of your cardiac patient, you wanna talk about modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Um, this is on page 618, 619. Um, things like, okay, things that are modifiable are things that people can change. So people can change the amount of exercise they get. They can um, change how much they smoke or whether or not they smoke. Um, they can stop drinking alcohol and doing drugs. Um, 
things they cannot change, things that are non-modifiable would be age, ethnicity, race, um, those type things that are not going to change, okay? Psychological risk factors for cardiovascular disease include people that have a type A personality. In other words, that person who's very competitive, very driven, always really busy, always worried about a deadline, that kind of thing. Um, also people who are under a lot of stress. So when people you know, go through a divorce or have a sick child um, or, or are in nursing school, right? Um, also people with anger issues, people that you know, have a difficulty um, controlling their emotions are at higher risk for cardiovascular problems. So you wanna take a medical history and find out if they've ever had cardiac problems before, if they have risk factors such as hypertension, if they've had any previous treatments for cardiovascular disease, um, if they're on medications, or if they've ever had an intervention such as a stent placed in the heart. Also check out their drug history, their social history, their nutrition. Do they eat fast food all the time? Do they fry their food all the time? Do they ever eat vegetables? Um, all of those play a huge role in cardiovascular health because of the lipids, the cholesterol, triglycerides, all that, okay? You know if they're high, people are at a greater risk for cardiovascular disease because all that um, fat is gonna clog up the arteries. Do they have a family history? Now, let me tell you, family history is huge in cardiovascular disease. Um, I once took care of somebody who had, he had cardiovascular disease and all four of his brothers, mm. everybody, every male in that family had cardiovascular disease. Um, and people can, they can be in the best shape, they can you know, exercise all the time and not smoke and not be a diabetic. And um, if they have a strong family history, they almost for sure will end up in the cath lab at some point in their life. Okay, also current health problems. Are they experiencing any chest pain? Are they experiencing any dizziness? Anything that would give, give you a cue that they may be having cardiovascular issues? And a functional history. Um, if they can go out and work in the yard for, you know, 20 minutes, whereas um, and a year ago or six months ago, they could go out in the yard and work for two hours. Um, that's a significant change in their functional history, and that would be worth noting. Their general appearance, are they pale? Are they diaphoretic? Are they having any difficulty breathing? Their skin color and temperature. If they're not getting um, good oxygenation, if they don't have good cardiac output, their skin is not going to be nice and pink and warm and dry, okay? Um, it's going to be pale to cyanotic, bluish, um, and cooler. Also look at their extremities. Do they have any swelling? Um, what is their blood pressure? Check all the venous and arterial pulses, which that is in your text. Also, if you look on page 624, it gives you the pulse points for assessments of the arterial pulses. So you want to check all of those. You want to inspect, palpate, percuss, and auscultate the precordium, which is the chest area. And this is on page 625, figure 30.6. Um, so you look at the chest, note whether the chest um, looks symmetrical, okay? Um, remember the barrel chest with the COPD patient you would want to take note if somebody came in and had a barrel chest. Um, some people also have a concave chest or they may have one side that's larger than the other. Um, as far as palpating, you want to palpate if there's any obvious mass or anything funky going on there. And you also, when you're inspecting, you want to look um, to see if you can note a pacemaker. You will see it under the skin, um, up near the clavicle. 
For cussing, we really don't do that as nurses so much, um, unless you're in a really highly specialized cardiac clinic somewhere. Not, it wouldn't be around here in Thomasville. <laughs> um, but you can learn to do that, and by all means, do it if you would like to. But we're not going to learn it here. So, auscultation. Now, what are the normal heart sounds? What are the abnormal heart sounds? So, critical care nurses and advanced practice nurses are qualified to do the um, palpation and percussion assessments. Pretty much everybody listens, you know, whether you're in a med surge unit or in the ICU or in the ER or what you're going to, or in a doctor's office, um, you're going to listen to the heart sounds. So we're going to put the patient in a supine position. We want the head of the bed slightly elevated because people are usually more comfortable with it that way. And you can put the bed, the head of the bed up higher if they need it for comfort in breathing. But if you look on page 625, you see the aortic area. Now, you may have heard all people read Time Magazine as a way to remember um, these areas or all people eat trendy vegetables or, or something. No, trendy, it'd be trendy meats or something. You know, you can make it whatever mnemonic you want. <laughs> but if you look at the second right intercostal space, just to the right of the sternum. Okay, that is known as the aortic area. Hopefully you guys learned about this um, in the fundamentals. Your pulmonic area is directly across um, at the left second intercostal space. Okay, then you're going to go straight down from there to the fourth left intercostal space. All right, and that would be your right ventricular area. Now, right below that is your tricuspid area. This is the fifth left intercostal space, um, close to that sternal border, all right? So just beside the sternum. Then we have our mitral area. This mitral area, you um, really can go kind of from the middle of the clavicle and go straight down. Um, and this is known as the apex of the heart, okay? You're gonna go to the fifth left intercostal space, but you're not next to the sternum. You're more over in the um, center of that left part of the chest, okay? As you can see by the, um, the picture there. The one that's not really um, shown here that we, that we learn when we talk about um, all people or all patients um, take medications or however you want to remember it, that right ventricular area, um, there is a spot in that area called Herb's Point, okay? And um, that is another point that we listen to. And I'm not sure why it's not on this figure, but that's okay. Just so that you know, it's A, P, E, um, T, M, all right? And you need to have a good idea of where you're going to listen and what you're listening for, okay? You always want to be able to hear the lub dub, the S1, S2. So you want to note whether you hear any extra sounds. You also want to note um, whether or not the rhythm is regular. So for instance, if somebody is in a dysrhythmia like atrial fibrillation, also known as AFib, they will not have a normal lub dub Love dub. It'll go love dub, love dub dub, love dub dub dub, love dub dub. Okay, or something like that. The psychosocial assessment is so important because many cardiac patients are depressed, they become depressed. Um, it's very frightening, it's a major life crisis. Um, it is a major ordeal when someone suddenly has a heart attack or suddenly starts having chest pain. Um, so you want to assess their coping behavior. You want to make sure that they have a good support system. You want to make sure that they're not turning to alcohol um, or maybe drugs. Usually it's alcohol um, 
to cope with the fear of what's going on um, or to sort of, you know, deny it. Um, okay, so we have laboratory assessment. We have serum markers that can be obtained quickly. The results are back in 15 to 20 minutes. And then we do serial cardiac enzymes, which are repeated every three to six hours to look at the trend. Um, because once something goes up, we need to see it come down to know that the patient's myocardium is no longer ischemic, okay? So the troponin are the most looked at of the cardiac markers. You have a troponin T and a troponin I. You will not see a troponin at all in a healthy adult, okay? So you should not, they should, the lab test should not um, see any troponin. So the troponin T is treated aggressively if it's seen because it increases the risk of death if it's found in the patient. So your troponin 1 or troponin I is a um, only elevated during a myocardial infarction or injury, okay? The myoglobin may be seen. This should be less than 90. You don't have to know the um, specifics. Just know if the troponin is elevated or if the myoglobin is elevated, all right? This indicates a myocardial infarction. Serum cardiac enzymes were used in the past, but no longer recommended, uh, but you would possibly see a CK or CKMB on your um, labs if you have, you know, a doctor that likes to look at those as well, okay? Now, I mentioned the lipids earlier. Your serum lipids are risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So your total lipids, um, your cholesterol should be less than 200. Your triglycerides for females, they should be 35 to 135. For males, it should be 40 to 160. For your happy cholesterol, your HDL or high density lipoproteins, we want those to be greater than 55 for females and greater than 45 for males. Um, the closer to 100, the better. For your low de density lipoproteins or LDLs, this is your bad cholesterol, we want that below 130. And you wanna have three times as much happy cholesterol as low density or bad cholesterol. So it should be a three to one ratio. Um, there is something called homocysteine, which is produced when proteins are broken down. So if there are elevated levels in the blood, this shows a risk, again, for cardiovascular disease. The C-reactive protein, also known as CRP, is an inflammation marker. This helps manage statin therapy in adults at risk for cardiac disease after uh, an MI in particular, after a myocardial infarction. So we want the C-reactive protein to be less than one milligram, um, but an elevation of the CRP would indicate tissue infarction or damage. Other diagnostic tests that we can do, a chest X-ray may be done, chest PA and lateral. Um, this just looks at the size of the heart. They can see any pulmonary lung issues going on. And if they have any central lines or chest tube or something, that would also show on an x-ray. Now, angiography and arteriography are invasive, and the patient will need to get contrast, and um, they use fluoroscopy so that they can see where the contrast goes. This is done by an interventional radiologist, usually. Um, done when there is speculation that there is an obstruction or narrowing in the artery or an aneurysm. So this is also done um, by the cardiologist. And specifically, if, if they're looking at the heart, a cardiologist normally does that part. If they're looking um, peripheral vascularly, that's usually done um, by the interventional radiologist. And then a cardiac catheterization is the other um, 
form of assessment that is done. So for your cardiac catheterization, this is the most definitive and most invasive test in the diagnosis of heart disease. Cardiac cath may include the studies of the right or left side of the heart and arteries. Um, typically, if they're going in, if they assume that there is um, a blockage in an artery, that is done using a left heart catheterization. I mean, that's what they're looking for when they do a left heart. So they'll go into the left side of the heart and look at the arteries. When you're doing a right side heart catheterization, that is generally done to um, look at the pressures in the heart, okay? Some of the most common indications for cardiac cath are found in your book. Turn on, because we need to um, change the page, not page number. Indications for cardiac cath are found on page 628, table 30.4, okay? So we're gonna look, do a heart catheterization to confirm suspected heart disorders, including congenital abnormalities, um, coronary artery disease, myocardial disease, valvular disease, and valvular dysfunction. We're going to do a cardiac cath to determine the location and extent of the disease process. We can do this to assess stable severe angina that is unresponsive to medical management, unstable angina, or uncontrolled heart failure, ventricular dysrhythmias, or cardiogenic shock associated with an MI um, or some other kind of dysfunction, um, a perforation of the septum, or a ventricular aneurysm. Also, a cath may be done to determine the best therapeutic option um, it, in case there is a blockage. They want to look at how bad the blockage is and then determine what they can do. Do they need to place a stent? Can they just do um, an angioplasty? Normally an angioplasty is done now and then a stent is placed after it. Um, or do they need to go in and do actual bypass surgery? And also, they will do a cath to help evaluate the effects of medical or invasive treatment um, to see if a stent is still open, um, to see if bypasses are still open after coronary artery bypass, because sometimes, unfortunately, those grafts will close off. So as far as preparing the patient, we want to assess their physical and psychosocial readiness and their level of knowledge about the procedure. Many of them are really anxious when they go in for a heart cath, so it's good to um, help them, you know, to talk about things and help ease that anxiety. Um, of course, you want to have the consent signed. Make sure the, the doctor has spoken to them. They've signed the consent. You want to ask about allergies, um, especially to contrast, if they've ever had contrast dye before. Um, we need to know if they have any allergies to that, if they have um, allergies to shellfish. Um, that is typically related to contrast dye allergy. Um, some of the risk, risks of complications, um, they may certainly have a stroke or an MI, unfortunately, during a heart cath, um, risk for bleeding, thromboembolism, lethal dysrhythmias, arterial dissection, and death is actually a risk factor um, or a possible complication. Um, all of these are really rare, thankfully, um, but of course they, they do happen. So the cardiologist or interventional radiologist will obtain the written consent, as you know. Um, complications from specifically right-sided heart cath include thrombophlebitis, pulmonary embolism, and a vagal response, meaning their heart rate and blood pressure drop. Left-sided heart catheterization, um, typical complications would be an MI, a stroke, bleeding, and dysrhythmias. 
complications that happen in both right-sided and left-sided heart cath include cardiac tamponade, hypovolemia, pulmonary edema, hematoma or blood loss at the insertion site, and reaction to the contrast medium. <clears throat> So usually, um, if the patient is not already in the hospital as an inpatient, they will be admitted to the hospital on the day. Um, if there's any renal dysfunction, they will need to be admitted the day before so they can have fluids and special medications to protect their kidneys from the contrast. Um, I mean, they can, it, it can be so bad that they would have to have dialysis. That's how important it is to make sure of their renal function and to protect the renal system if needed. Let's see. So normally the, you know, usual standard tests will be done preoperatively. They'll have a chest X-ray, a CBC coagulation studies, and a 12-lead EKG. The patient will be MPO after midnight. If the procedure is going to be later in the day, they can have a liquid breakfast. Um, the cath site will be clipped, the hairs will be clipped, then it will be cleansed. Um, and again, just make sure the consent is signed and check the kidney function as well. All right, so um, afterwards, if the patient experiences any cardiac ischemia, um, in other words, if they have chest pain or dysrhythmias, if they're bleeding, if there's a hematoma at the site that they went in, um, or any kind of dramatic change in the peripheral pulses in the affected extremity, you want to contact the rapid response team or physician immediately. Also, neurological changes indicating a possible stroke, such as vision disturbances, slurred speech, or swallowing difficulties and extremity weakness, have to be reported immediately as well. Other diagnostics that are done, you know about the EKG or ECG. Um, they can do a TEE, which is a transesophageal echocardiogram. Um, I'll explain that more in lecture, but um, people wear sometimes a halter monitor, which is um, something that that um, records and transmits their EKG um, while they're doing exercise or while they're having a uh, stress test. Sometimes they wear them for days. The EPS is the um, electrophysiologic studies. Now these are done um, invasively. The, there is an electrical stimulation of the heart so if somebody who has, survi has survived a cardiac arrest, but they have recurring um, dysrhythmias, they want to study that to find out what is causing the heart to do that and how sensitive the heart um, electrical system is. Um, also people who have unexplained syncopal episodes, so somebody that's passing out and they don't know why, um, it's, the risks are similar to that of a heart catheterization. The stress test is done. Um, there has to be a consent. They can have a light meal. They shouldn't smoke or drink caffeine prior to the stress test. Wear comfortable clothes and supportive shoes. They will be put on the treadmill while hooked up to an EKG. Um, they have to let the person doing the stress test know if they have any chest pain or shortness of breath. That is, the patient has to let the person performing the stress test know. Okay, an echocardiogram is just like an ultrasound of the heart. Um, the TEE is where they actually go down the throat um, and transesophageal, so they go down the esophagus. Um, They're gonna look at the cardiac structures with a transducer behind the heart um, within the esophagus, okay? The prep and follow-up is just like an upper GI endoscopy. It's very interesting and gives them a lot of really good inf information. The MNPI, there are different types. Um, there is a radioactive trans tracer, excuse me, um, 
that helps visualize cardiovascular abnormalities, detect MI, um, also decrease myocardial blood flow and left ventricular ejection. It can be thallium or technetia. Anyway, it can be a couple different things. <laughs> it is non-invasive, um, but there is some radiation exposure, but it is minimal, okay? Um, and patients should avoid caffeine and cigarettes four hours prior to testing. Also, before an MRI, ensure that the patient has removed all metallic objects, including watches, jewelry, clothing with metal fasteners, and hair clips. Patients with pacemaker or implanted defibrillator may not be able to have an MRI because the magnetic, magnetic field may deactivate the pacemaker or um, defibrillator. So always really good to know if your patient has one before they go for an MRI. Okay, we're going to stop there and you can go over the questions yourself. Thank you.